All right, joining me once again here on The Matthew Filipovich Show is my friend David Dayan. David is an independent journalist whose work you can find at davedayan.com. You can also find him on Twitter at ddayan. David, thank you so much for being on the show again. Thank you for having me, Matthew. All right, so David, Elizabeth Warren recently had a, a good student loan interest rate bill that was, of course, defeated by filibuster in the Senate. Uh, but you actually recently wrote a really good piece for Salon that actually discussed how focusing on interest rates actually obscures the larger crisis of the cost of going to college and university. You actually talk about like kind of a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy when it comes to dealing with that. Uh, tell us first about the long-term strategy. Yeah, I, I just believe that the long-term goal shouldn't be about making, you know, student loans more affordable. The, the long-term yeah. goal should be about making them irrelevant. And yeah. the way you do that is you take all the current dollars that are put to use in grants and loan subsidies and tax preferences for higher education, and if you add all that money up, you could pay the tuition annually of every student going to a public college or university. So you end up having a sort of two-tiered system. You have this public option that is free or near free. And then you have uh, a private option that if people want to go to, you know, the Harvards and Dukes of the world, the private prestigious colleges and universities, uh, they can, uh, but that would have to be, uh, you know, basically their responsibility to get there. Um, there would still be academic scholarships and, and, you know, those, those private institutions uh, they have a preference for diversity and things, and I, I don't think it would really change that equation too much. But what this would do is offer the possibility of higher education, which we know has uh, huge benefits in terms of career earnings potential over time. Uh, this would open that up to everybody, and it would eliminate this, this real burdensome crisis of student debt which is really having an economic impact in the country uh, as people who come out with tens of thousands of dollars in debt uh, end up delaying major purchases and lowering uh, that economic activity, uh, you know, things like houses or cars. So uh, that, that's really, I think, what should be the long-term goal of the, the activist community around student debt. And, and, and this is not something that is, uh, you know, just a fantasy kind of realm here. And it's not just yeah. that countries around the world do this. It's that right here in America, uh, until very recently, this was the, the real strategy of the state of California. The California master plan of the 1950s and 1960s had free colleges and universities that were public, the UC system, the California state system, the community college system was all basically free uh, or as close to it as you could get. And then there were yeah. private colleges like USC and other, other Stanford that, uh, you know, cost more money. And this made California one of the most prosperous states and maybe one of the most prosperous places in the, in the world uh, because it had such a talented, and well-educated workforce. So that's the idea. Well, so what what happened? I mean, like, what happened in California to change that? I mean, I, obviously, the right wingers got their claws into this, and uh, the you know the 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 anti spenders got. But how did that how did that actually come down where they actually Prop shifted that cost? Happened. What what happened there? Yeah, I mean, Prop Thirteen happened, and and Prop yeah. Thirteen uh, significantly lowered the resources that the state had, and they gradually pulled back from the investments in public education and tuition, you know, gradually went up and, and that's, that's your answer. Uh, right. Tuition is still relatively maybe uh, uh, somewhat affordable, but it's gone up by leaps and bounds, especially in the last crisis when the, the money just wasn't there. So uh, the difference here when we're talking about a, a free public option is to leverage the federal resources the federal grants, the federal tax preferences, the federal uh, subsidies 
and use that so that the state isn't the only entity that is providing the resources for a free, a free uh, option for, for higher education. So, so that would be the difference. And so at, at the very beginning, you said that if we, if we actually took the, what, what's being spent on the federal level, we could theoretically pay for state and community colleges for everyone who actually wanted to do that. If we actually took what we were currently spending right now federally, that could go and actually provide that for the entire, essentially the entire country almost, or yeah, would we the hit numbers- it? The numbers do add up, and it's, it's hmm. because of a misallocation of resources. I mean, we're right. using these tax preferences uh, so that people can send their kids to Harvard. You know, I mean, the, the, a lot of the money ends up going or goes to, you know, I mean, in terms of loan subsidies, uh, a staggering amount of, of student loans are used at for-profit colleges. Uh, which have the highest default rates because they're basically right. diploma mills where people get worthless degrees afterwards and can't do anything with them. So it's, a, it's this misallocation of resources that uh, prevents us from coming up with this very intuitive public-private system where you have this near-free public option because we believe that investing in students uh, pays off in the long run for the entire country. And then you have this private option where if people want to go to more prestigious universities, uh, they can, uh, and, and they can, can, you know, muster up the resources for that. 